We're very excited to present the final part of our um, of the 2013 IARC speaker series. Um, the title today is Admiration and Appropriation Native Art Globalized by Adrienne Keene. She is a um, doctoral candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Education in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her academic research focuses on the college access for American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian students and the role of pre-college access programs in student success. She is also interested in issues of sovereignty and self-determination in indigenous education. Outside of the classroom, she is a blogger and an activist on issues of Native representation and cultural appropriation. Her blog, Native Appropriations, has received over 1.3 million page views. Keen's work has been featured on Al Jazeera, Current TV, Indian Country Today, E! Online, uh, Radicalicious Social Images, Jezebel, Native People's Magazines, as well as others. So we are thrilled that you all can be here for the Indian Arts Research Center um, at the School for Advanced Research for our final uh, speaker. And um, we're glad to have you here at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. So um, please join me in welcoming our speaker today. Adrian Keen Dawado, Chichalagi, Dalunige de la Jutla Jinela. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian Keen. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, um, but I currently live in Boston. I'm originally from Southern California as well. Um, so, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited to um, talk with you all about my, uh, the work that I do with my blog and some issues of cultural appropriation um, in fashion and pop culture. So um, thank you very much to SAR for inviting me, um, and like I said, I'm excited to be here. So I'm trying out some new technology. Um, I am connected to my laptop via my iPhone, so we'll, hopefully everything goes according to plan um, with that. So today, uh, what I'm going to talk with you about is um, we'll start with talking about what is cultural appropriation um, and why we should care about it. Um, then I'll give a little bit of history of my blog and the work that I do there. Um, and we'll go into some case studies, um, specifically Urban Outfitters, which recently um, is in the process of a lawsuit um, with the Navajo Nation over trademark um, violations, and Paul Frank. Um, and just briefly, did anyone come to Jessica Metcalf's um, talk a few weeks ago? A couple of you. Okay, so there will be a tiny bit of overlap with um, what she talked about uh, via the Paul Frank controversy, but I'll try to keep things fresh. Um, and then I'll give a, a couple of signs of progress with um, the Beyond Buckskin Boutique, which is Jessica Metcalf's um, new initiative, and uh, things like Project Runway. Um, so to start, I wanted to just throw some images up there to kind of let you uh, give a, a grounding and a framework for what we're talking about. So um, this is some gorgeous uh, indigenous contemporary art, most of it. So um, we've got some uh, work by Virgil Ortiz up there. Um, there's uh, some work by Alano Aderza. Um, and then that down in the bottom is Joseph Medicine Crow um, when he received his um, Presidential Medal of Freedom. So I wanted to start with these images. Um, there's uh, all sorts of tribes and regions represented up here. We have um, Lakota moccasins. We have um, Ojibwe mittens. Um, Etc. So to give a kind of grounding of this beautiful art is what we're talking about. But um, what we're going to be shifting the focus to today is to talk about images like this. So um, this first image here is from um, ASOS, which is a, a brand. Um, and I don't know if you can read the text, but it actually says, um, they invented chewing gum and chocolate, but surely the Aztec's greatest achievement was inspiring these fresh prints. So uh, those are the, the Aztec Navajo prints. Um, that's Hello Kitty wearing um, some war paint and a little feathered headdress there. Um, this is from the Victoria's Secret Fashion Show that happened a few months back. Um, that's 
Carly Kloss, who is a supermodel wearing a war bonnet and some buckskin, and of course, super traditional leopard print bikini. Um, this is from a window of J. Crew, a nice little teepee there. Here's some moccasins that um, are from House of Harlow, which is um, Nicole Ritchie's uh, fashion line, and uh, they're children's moccasins, and they sell for about $300. Um, this is from Tommy Hilfiger, a uh, little uh, plain Indian going on there. This is from um, Echo, which is a kind of a street brand. They have a whole line called Weekend Warrior that features these skulls wearing headdresses. Um, this is Jeremy Scott, partnered with Adidas and uh, took some major liberty in stealing from <coughs> Northwest Coast totem pole designs. Um, that's another shot from his collection. Um, and all of those images, that's, we'll talk more about what these mean, but I just wanted to throw those out there to get started. So all of those are from non-native designers. All of those are um, not benefiting native people in any way uh, and are from major multinational companies that are profiting off of um, these images. And when you put them next to those initial images that I showed, you can kind of see the, the direct inspiration, quote unquote, um, that comes from there. So what is cultural appropriation? So this is a pretty simple quote. I'm gonna rotate so I can read it off the screen. Um, Taking from a culture that is not one's own intellectual property, cultural expressions and artifacts, history and ways of knowledge. Um, and this comes from an article by um, Rebecca Sosi, who is an awesome scholar out at ASU. Um, and so this is a pretty basic definition. It's uh, taking from a culture that's not one's own. Um, but what does that really mean? Um, so why is that an issue? So some of the, the harms of cultural appropriation that I've sort of pulled out, they kind of fall into two categories. Um, one is the sort of economic arguments, and then the other is the sort of moral and cultural arguments. So the economic arguments tend to be easier for people to swallow. They make a little bit more sense. Um, so we're talking about intellectual property of tribes and communities and individual artists. Um, these are their designs, their images, um, that are being used without permission, used out of context, um, and their, um, their, their ownership is, um, is being stripped away in that sense. Um, and then we'll talk more about um, the Navajo Nation, but these, uh, some of these things are actually under trademark or copyright protection. Um, things like tribal names, like the Navajo name, is actually trademarked by the community. Um, then there's the fact that the group that is using these images is um, benefiting um, monetarily while the group that the images are being taken from are not. Um, but then on the other side of things, which I personally feel is the, the deeper issue but is a little bit harder for people to grasp are the more moral and cultural issues. Um, so that quote comes from Sosi as well. Um, so cultural appropriation interferes with a community's ability to define and establish its own identity. So if you as a community have these cultural markers, these artifacts, these images that are what you use to define who you are as a people, and then anyone is just coming and using these images out of context, it interferes with that ability for you to say, this is Navajo, this is Cherokee, um, this is what it means to be a part of my community. Uh, and a lot of these images, as you saw with the headdresses, these are sacred aspects of culture that are being taken out of context. And in that process, are kind of stripping away the cultural power of them. So if a headdress, for example, is reserved for the most respected cultural leaders in, um, in communities, is something that has to be earned, not anyone can just wear it. Um, if you're putting it on a skull, if you're putting it on a monkey, which we'll see <laughs> later, that really is taking away the importance and power of it, and in the process, um, dehumanizing native peoples as well. Um, and it leads into stereotyping. So all of these images are lumped in, as you saw, Aztec and Navajo being put together as like tribal trends, um, the Northwest Coast totem pole designs being put with Southwestern designs to be labeled as native. So all of this kind of contributes to that ongoing stereotype of native peoples as one sort of monolithic culture, um, rather than the 566 tribes that we are, we're represented by this one set of stereotypes. Um, which is a, a danger that comes out of cultural appropriation. 
And then the final piece is about cultural survival and cultural sovereignty. And what Rebecca Sosi talks about um, in her article is that there, uh, in order for tribes to be completely sovereign and to um, assert their rights as sovereign nations, there is economic sovereignty, so that's control over the, the money and the economic um, ventures of your tribe. There's things like um, more tangible aspects of culture like land and um, cultural resources that tribes need to have access to. But the last piece of the cultural sovereignty is really being able to have control um, over your own cultural practices. And for a, a tribe to be completely sovereign, she feels that they have to have all of these pieces. And I definitely agree that cultural appropriation in a lot of ways interferes with that last piece of cultural sovereignty. But what it really comes down to is issues of power. So what this is, is no matter what, you have an imbalance of power. So it's uh, the majority group who's taking from a community that is marginalized and is not in a position of power. So even as Native peoples are fighting back against these images, are um, saying that these are not things that we're comfortable with, these are things that are offensive to us, uh, we are in a position of power to be able to fight back in a lot of ways. So while it may seem that it's all in good fun or that communities are, are that fashion designers are being inspired or honored or honoring Native um, communities, when you have that constant power imbalance, um, it's never going to be an equal exchange of ideas um, and intellectual property. It's always going to be that imbalance. But on a more real uh, level for me, why it matters um, is I think summed up pretty well by this quote by Buffy St. Marie, who's a, a native singer and educator. Um, and she says, non-Indian people have very little accurate information about Native American anything, and Native Americans suffer from being misperceived all our lives because of this lack of information. Our history is still fictionalized, then exploited, and our contemporary realities are mostly absent from the public eye. It's no wonder Indian people have a hole where our self-esteem ought to be. And so what these images do is they, uh, as I mentioned before with the stereotyping, they kind of replace our contemporary existence with this sort of fantasized, historicized um, image of what it means to be an Indian. And even just spending the day here in Santa Fe, I've been really struck by the fact that native cultures and presence are really alive here. You can see it in a lot of aspects of the community, but that's something that is not the case for most places in the United States. So for most native, or for most non-native people, they never encounter um, contemporary native folks. And the only images that they encounter are these uh, images in fashion and Hollywood and um, other sort of mainstream media. So um, at this point is usually when people start to get skeptical. And so I've heard all these things before, you know, like get over it, it's not a big deal. Uh, don't you have bigger things to worry about? Um, I'm Irish, German, whatever. I don't get offended by the fighting Irish or people wearing lederhosen or anything like that. Um, it's just art or fashion, inspiration comes from everywhere. Um, but we're honoring you. Uh, well, why are you wearing jeans and speaking English? You're appropriating from me. So there's a lot of resistance to um, this discussion about what cultural appropriation is, what it means, and what we should do about it. So I'm not going to spend a, little time, er, a lot of time refuting each of these, but at the end, if you want me to go back and talk about them, I have responses for every single one. Um, <laughs> But I will say the biggest thing is with the whole um, get over it, it's not a big deal, don't you have bigger issues? That's the one that I probably get the pushback, pushback on the most. Um, and the reality is yes, Native communities have much bigger issues to deal with. We have um, a lot of challenges in our communities, but to me I see them all as being tied in together. So if the rest of the United States, if the rest of the world only sees Native people as this kind of one-sided stereotype, then it's going to be impossible for them to recognize our contemporary existence, which includes the, cha the, re the real challenges on, on the reservations and in our communities. So I think in order for us to really progress as Native folks with the, the help and allies within the broader community, we need to start deconstructing these images and start replacing them with true and contemporary images. So that brings me to Native appropriations. 
Um, so this is my blog. Um, this is, uh, I started the blog in late 2010. It was the first year of my graduate program. Um, and I've always been really interested in representations of Native people. Um, that was kind of what my focus was as an undergraduate. I did my senior thesis on contemporary Indian art um, and the ways that sort of outside Western forces have um, forced contemporary Indian artists to shape um, their subjects and their style of painting. Um, I interned at museums and that sort of stuff. Um, so this was always something that really interested me. And then I had the opportunity to work in undergraduate admissions at my alma mater and got exposed to the world of education. And so ultimately decided to go to graduate school in education. Um, and now my work is on college access. But um, I never lo lost my love and interest in representations of native folks. So when I moved from California to Boston, um, it was definitely a new environment. Um, Boston is an interesting place um, coming from Southern California where I uh, was in a relatively diverse community. I moved out to uh, the East Coast and was the only Native student in my program. Um, I all of a sudden had to speak for all Native people all the time um, and it was a really strange transition. And most of my classmates had never met a Native person before. They had never been exposed to anything related to Indigenous education, to anything. Um, and so I got a lot of questions about my own identity, about um, what it meant to be a Native American, all sorts of things. Um, and so I started kind of questioning, like, what was it that made people on the East Coast just so completely unaware um, and hold so many stereotypes about Native people? And I went into Urban Outfitters one day, which is right across the street from my school. And it was uh, right at the start of all of this kind of tribal trends. And they had dream catchers, they had totem pole jewelry stands, they were selling moccasins, um, just anything imaginable, feathered earrings, all sorts of things. And something sort of clicked. And I realized that the only images that my classmates ever saw of Native folks were represented by these things in Urban Outfitters. And that was a problem. Um, so I s decided to kind of start pulling them together, start critiquing them. This was never something that I had done from like an academic standpoint. I didn't know the scholarship about cultural appropriation. I'm still learning. Um, what it really started as was just me throwing things up on the blog and saying, this is kind of problematic. What do you think about it? Um, and it's been a long journey of kind of gathering that language to be able to really deconstruct the images and express why it is that they're hurtful and why it is that they're wrong. And a lot of that has come from the community that has developed around the blog. Um, so I have some examples of the things that I, um, that I write about. Um, so this is the Urban Outfitters um, Navajo panty, Navajo socks, and Navajo flask, which we will talk more about. Um, this is a from a fashion, uh, like a hipster t-shirt line called No Wire Hangers. Um, so that is a skull wearing a headdress on a hipster. Um, this is an invitation from a party that was held at Harvard um, called Conquista Bros and Navajos. Um, and it was held by a fraternity. And the tagline across the bottom says, come dress to explore the new world or defend it. Um, so they really encourage folks to play Indian. Um, so I wrote about that. We actually got an apology from the, um, the fraternity um, and a write-up in the, the Harvard newspaper. And the fraternity ended up donating their annual food drive proceeds to um, a Native community, which was great. I wasn't sure how they were going to ship all of those cans to South Dakota, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Lego. Uh, Halloween costumes are definitely a big focus of my blog. Um, that's the, the sexy Native American Indian. Um, and the description says, play Pocahontas in the sexy Native American Indian costume and John Smith might give back Manhattan. Put the wow in powwow and party on. So talk a lot about that. Um, this is Johnny Depp as Tonto um, in the new Lone Ranger movie that's coming out um, in July. This has been a large focus on my blog for the last few months uh, because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, they're on this very much a, a public relations tour trying to fix things, but uh, everything I've seen is not making me hopeful for the future of that film. Uh, that comes from uh, Peter Pan. 
So talking about images in Hollywood, um, talk a lot about Indian mascots. Um, I am an alumna of Stanford, and Stanford used to be the Indians back um, until 1971, so it tends to pop up every now and again. Uh, that's Khloe Kardashian wearing a headdress, so this sneaks into the public sphere pretty often. Um, this is a book about uh, kids playing Indian. It's like a step-by-step -step guide. Cherokee Red Soda, uh, Fire Water Whiskey, a teepee for your cats, uh, baking powder. As you can see, uh, there are no shortage of images for me to talk about on the blog. Um, so to go a little more in depth, I wanna talk about two case studies. First is the Navajo um, Urban Outfitters case, and the second is Paul Frank's Dream Catching Pow Wow. Um, so we'll go through each of those. So Urban Outfitters. Like I mentioned, my very first post on the blog was about Urban Outfitters. Um, so I went and took pictures of some of the things that I thought were interesting and problematic. Um, and I never took my eye off of them because uh, they continued to mess up in the subsequent years. Uh, specifically, in 2011, um, I had been wandering around the store and saw plenty of pieces that were all happened to be labeled as Navajo, which was really interesting to me, um, and all kind of this like generic southwestern design. So um, I had talked a bit to um, my friend who was friends with uh, the lawyer for the Department of Justice at Navajo Nation and just like jokingly mentioned that they might want to check out Urban Outfitters because everything is called Navajo there. Um, and they actually went and put together a cease and desist letter, which I'll talk about more. But um, a couple of months later, I realized that I hadn't ever put a post together about um, the transgressions um, and Navajo. So I found, I think it was 24 products on the Urban Outfitters website that were labeled Navajo. So that was like Navajo panties, Navajo sweatshirt, Navajo flask, um, all sorts of things. Um, so I pulled it together in a post and then I put quotations from the cease and desist letter um, that Navajo had sent to Urban Outfitters. So what is interesting about Navajo is that they actually own the trademark for a bunch of derivatives of the, the use of the term Navajo in relation to clothing and design and home goods and things like that. Um, and Urban Outfitters could have been seen as violating those trademarks because they were selling these products um, labeled as Navajo. So let me... Um, so this was the cease and desist letter um, that they sent in uh, the end of June of 2011, and my post was in September, and they hadn't heard anything back um, at that point. So after I posted, um, a woman named Sasha Houston Brown read my post and wrote an open letter to Urban Outfitters. It got posted on Columbus Day, also known as Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so there was a lot of buzz around it um, and it went pretty viral. It got um, listed on ABC News, on Racialicious, on a bunch of other places. And what was interesting is we finally got a response from Urban Outfitters and the CEO said, um, or the public duration, uh, relations director, the, uh, the Native American inspired trend and specifically the term Navajo have been cycling through fashion, fine art, and design for the last few years. We currently have no plans to modify or discontinue any of these products. So I thought that was an interesting response. Um, but surprise, surprise, uh, just about a week or so later, or maybe about a month later, all of a sudden the products were gone off the website. Um, and there was no statement from the company, no anything, just quietly remove them. But Urban Outfitters is actually, um, they are owned by the same parent company who owns Anthropology and Free People. And, um, and so there are these other brands that were still continuing to use the Navajo name, but all fall under the same parent company. Um, so Navajo went ahead with the lawsuit. And there are definitely folks in this audience who know more about the legal side of this than I do, so I'll give my best interpretation as um, a non-legal scholar. But um, the grounds that they went ahead with the lawsuit were mostly over those other companies that have continued to use the Navajo name, and um, they went with the trademark violation argument. Um, 
Then there was a lot of back and forth about Urban Outfitters was trying to transfer the case to Pennsylvania away from New Mexico um, because they were arguing that uh, the New Mexico jury would be biased towards the Navajo Nation. But um, so far it looks like things are going to stay in New Mexico from what I understand.